News of the Times. Murderous Mondays. The infamous Mary Blandy case. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we jump back to 1751 and the then famous case of Mary Blandy, filled with intrigue and a classic, Did she or didn't she who done it? This case was tremendously important in its day, the then version of the trial. It is interesting to us that even back in 1751-1752, things have not changed much. Historically, the case remains a low-sided argument with those who are sure she knew exactly what she was doing and those who feel she was an innocent victim. We hope you enjoy the show. From the Caledonian Mercury, the April 1752, Francis Blandy, attorney at law, resided at Henley-on-Thames in the year 1751. He had a considerable practice. He filled the office of town clerk and was reputed to be very wealthy. At the time our narrative opens, Mr. Blandy was nearly 60 years of age and his wife some years older. They had but one child, a daughter, upon whom they naturally doted. Her education had been most carefully attended to, and every possible care taken to impress her mind with sentiments of virtue and religion. In person, Mary Blandy was far from beautiful, but she was sprightly and affable of disposition generous to the extreme, and much loved by the poor people of Henley-on-Thames. Mary Blandy had had the misfortune of having had smallpox, with corresponding marks scarring her face. She was known to have a fine figure and a dowry worth some £10,000, valued at nearly £3 million today. Mary had attended the social seasons in London and Bath without securing a husband, as her father's rigorous inspection precluded many a potential match. Mary was looking at potential spinsterhood. Mr. Blandy, as we have said, was reputed to be rich, and a number of young gentlemen courted his acquaintance with a view to gaining possession of the hand of his fair and gifted daughter. The old gentleman was exceedingly fond of company and was always well pleased to see a gay party of young people assembled round his dinner table. He was also very fond conversing with gentlemen who had served in the army, having, he said, felt in his younger days an inclination towards military life. Mary Blandy was about 26 years of age when she became acquainted with Captain William Henry Cranston, who was then 46. He was the son of Lord Cranston of an ancient family, allied by intermarriage with many of the most noble families in Scotland. He was, however, a younger son. With his commission in the army, and the interest of £1,500 settled upon him by a relation, it was all that he had to depend upon for his support. Being of noble birth and an officer in the army, Cranstone could be a leading contender as a suitable suitor to Mary. Additionally, Cranstone had also suffered smallpox with the accompanying scarring of his face. The problem was that he was already married. From the Caledonian Mercury, April 1752, squandered a fortune. Cranston married a Miss Murray in Scotland in the year 1745. The young lady brought him a handsome fortune, but he soon squandered it and receiving orders to join his regiment in England, was sent on a recruiting commission to Henley-on-Thames. He was there introduced to Mr. Blandy, who invited him to his house, and thus the first step was taken 
towards the unhappy connection which ended so fatally. In person, Cranston was diminutive and in features absolutely ugly. His face was terribly seamed with the smallpox and he squinted fearfully. Nevertheless, he possessed to perfection that easy flow of small talk and soft, insinuating voice which ever captivates the minds of the fair sex. Cranston had long been intimate with Miss Blandy before he commenced paying his addresses to her. She, of course, supposed him to be unmarried, and her father was open to flattery and so fond of being deemed a man of taste that it scarcely is to be wondered at that a man of Cranston's artifice should succeed in ingratiating himself into the good old gentleman's favour and readily obtain permission to pay court to his fair daughter. Apprehending that Miss Blandy might discover that he had a wife in Scotland, Cranston had the audacity to inform her that he was involved in a disagreeable lawsuit in that country with a young lady who claimed him as her husband, and so certain was the scoundrel of having obtained Mary's confidence and affections that he asked her if she loved him well enough to await the issue of the affair. Mary answered readily that she was willing enough to do so, provided he obtained the consent of her father and mother. This was certainly a most extraordinary declaration of love, and as extraordinary a reply. In reality, Cranston's wife was a Roman Catholic at a time when feelings still ran high on the question of religion. Cranston's argument was that his wife was actually his mistress and that he had promised to marry her when she adopted the Presbyterian faith, which she had not done. Even with the birth of a little girl, Cranston insisted that she was not his proper wife and persuaded the Blandy household that his supposed marriage would be overturned in the Scottish courts. From the Caledonian Mercury, April 1752, persevered. For months, Cranston persevered in his amour, but endeavoured to carry it on with all possible secrecy. It, however, reached the ears of his cousin, Lord Mark Hare, who, being slightly acquainted with Mr. Blandy, wrote to that gentleman, informing him that the captain had a wife and children in Scotland, and conjuring to him to preserve his daughter from ruin. This intelligence greatly alarmed Mr. Blandy, and seeking Mary without delay, he laid the letter before her. She, however, appeared to attract little importance to the matter, for she placed full faith in the statement which Cranstoun had made to her, and had been for some weeks prepared to receive such news. When Mr. Blandy laid the letter before Cranston, the latter appeared slightly indignant. He declared that Lord Kerr had acted most ungenerously, and took his oath that it was only a little affair of gallantry, of which he should soon be able to free himself without difficulty. Mrs. Blandy was nearly as infatuated with the captain as her daughter, and was weak enough to be satisfied by his bare assurance that the report of his marriage was false. Cranston, however, appears to have felt very uneasy at the position of his affairs. He at once saw the necessity for devising some scheme to get his first marriage annulled, or of bidding adieu to all the gratifications he had promised himself by wedding Mary Blandy. Mrs. Blandy believed Cranston's explanations that the Scottish courts would overturn his marriage with Anne. He was wrong. As Cranston brought his case to the Scottish courts again and again, only to have his request rejected, Anne, Cranston's real wife, 
sent a copy of the decision by the courts confirming the marriage between herself and Cranstoon to Mr. Blandy. The document decreed that Anne and Cranstoon were indeed man and wife. Mr. Blandy was infuriated. Simultaneously, Cranstoon's own personal financial position suffered with increasing debts accumulated. Additionally, the courts had decreed that Cranstoon was ordered to pay the maintenance of both his wife and child. Mrs. Blandy's Illness Cranstoon managed to persuade Mrs. Blandy that all would be sorted upon his appeal to the courts. Both Mrs. Blandy and Mary were staying in London for medical advice. Their uncle there refused Cranstoon's entry into his house point blank. Cranstoon's dream of Mary's fortune seemed to be slipping away from him. Secret Marriage it came out in the trial that a secret marriage had taken place according to the customs of the Church of England. Both Mary and Cranstoon claimed this to be true, although legally Cranstoon would have no legal right. Upon their return to Henley, Mrs. Blandy became ill and died. The death certificate stated that the cause was intestinal inflammation. Those in the household were not altogether convinced, and local gossip had it that Mary had poisoned her mother. From the Caledonian Mercury, April 1752, Blind Confidence Acting upon the advice of some friends who had his interest sincerely at heart, Mr. Blandy told the captain that he must discontinue his visits and give up all idea of marriage with Mary. Cranston's marriage to his wife Anne remained unresolved. Cranston appeared stung to madness by this decision of his old friend, but before leaving Henley on Thames, he contrived to obtain a long interview with Mary, during which he told her that he knew of a method of conciliating her parents' esteem. A friend of his, a cunning woman, could make a certain powder which, if properly administered, would soon cause the old gentleman to look upon him again in friendly manner. This powder he promised to send, and, to prevent suspicion, said that he would write on the cover powders to clean scotch pebbles. The powders were duly sent to Mary, which Mary began placing in Mr. Blandy's tea with the supposed hope that his attitude toward Cranston would soften. Mr. Blandy's Illness In June of that year, Mr. Blandy was frequently unwell. On two occasions, his leftover remaining tea was drunk by local servants. In the first instance, Susan Gunnell, one of the household servants, drank Mr. Blandy's leftover tea and became violently ill for three days. On another occasion, Anne Emmett, another household servant, drank Mr. Blandy's leftover tea and was so ill she nearly died. Mary, upon hearing of the illness, sent Anne some white wine, some whey, and broth to her, supposed cures at the time for arsenical poisoning. Letters were produced showing Mary writing to Cranstoon saying that the powders were not working. Cranstoon's response was to tell her to put the powders in anything where it would not float. The Poisonous Gruel On the 4th of August, some gruel was prepared for Mr. Blandy. The help watched Mary stir something between her fingers into the gruel. Upon Mr. Blandy eating some of the gruel, he became violently ill, vomiting and in great pain. Upon the apothecary arriving, Mary lied and stated he had only had some peas to tea. Two days later, more gruel was served to Mr. Blandy, spoon-fed by Mary. Upon eating some of the prepared gruel, he began immediately to vomit and writhe in pain. 
The following morning, one of the servants had some of the remaining gruel from Mr. Blandy's meal the previous day and became violently ill. There is little direct evidence of Mary Blandy having any idea of the powders sent by Cranstoun being of a poisonous nature. She seems rather to have been infatuated by her love for the villain who found in her too ready a tool with whom which to work out his dark schemes, and to have attracted in blind confidence in all that he proposed. The powders were sent by Cranstoun according to promise, and Mr. Blandy, having caught cold and being somewhat indisposed on the Sunday before his death, Susan Gunnell, a maid-servant, mixed him some gruel into which Miss Blandy put some of the powders which her treacherous lover had sent her, and with her own hands gave the gruel to her sick parent. The dose was repeated the next day, and the poor old gentleman was immediately seized with the most violent pains in his bowels. The household had now become suspicious that Mary was attempting to poison Mr. Blandy. The pan with the gruel was examined only to find white, gritty sediment on the bottom. The pan was handed to the apothecary for testing to be done. Mr. Blandy was informed that it was believed that Mary was attempting to poison him. They went further and stated they believed that Cranston was behind the whole matter. The following day, Mr. Blandy, upon coming down for breakfast and being handed a cup of tea from Mary, tasted the tea and commented upon its grittiness. Mary turned white. Later that morning she was found placing letters and powders into the fire. What could be saved was retrieved by the servants, including one packet which said the powder to clean the pebbles with. Impending death. Dr. Addington was called on to Mr. Blandy's bedside, as Mr. Blandy's condition worsened. Mr. Blandy displayed all the common signs associated with having been poisoned. Dr. Addington asked if he knew he was being poisoned. Mr. Blandy responded yes, and that it was a poor lovesick girl. Mary attempted to warn Cranstoun of the aroused suspicions, and accordingly wrote him a letter. The letter was intercepted by Mr. Blandy's clerk, and would serve to add to the burgeoning mountain of evidence against Mary Blandy. From the Caledonian Mercury, April 1752, begged forgiveness. The disorder soon increased so much that a nurse and physician had to be sent for. The medical man shook his head and said plainly that Mr. Blandy had but a few hours to live, whereupon the horror-stricken Mary rushed like one distracted into her father's room and falling on her knees by his bedside, confessed to mixing the powder in the gruel and begged the forgiveness of her dying parent. Banish me! "'Where you please,' cried the wretched girl, "'do with me what you like, but forgive me, "'and as for Cranston, I will never see him, "'speak to him, or write to him, "'as long as I live, if you will but forgive me.' "'I forgive thee, dear Mary,' answered the good old man, "'and I will pray God to forgive thee, "'but thou shouldst have considered, dearest, "'before thou attempted to take the life of thy father, thou shouldst have considered that I was thy own father. Mr. Blandy lingered a day or two in the greatest agony, praying for the welfare of his daughter. On the 14th of August, Mr. Blandy died in extreme pain. Forensic Evidence Given the strong circumstantial evidence of Mr. Blandy's position in the town, attempts were made to forensically test for poisoning. As such a full autopsy took place with the organs of the body, the conclusion was 
that Mr. Blandy had died from poison and that he had been murdered. The white powder was tested with a chemist who concluded that the powder was arsenic. These results were confirmed by a separate chemist who also tested the powder. Mary's escape. Seeing how things were progressing, Mary looked to flee. She is recorded as having asked the footman to escape with her to France. He refused. She asked one of the servants to order a post-chase to go to London Inn. She refused. She was seen running through the streets only partly dressed with a baying mob after her. It was suspected she had been trying to make a run for it. She was caught and jailed. The trial of Miss Blandy took place on the 3rd of March, 1752. The trial looked bleak for Mary. In 18th century England, the killing of a parent or master was considered the most heinous of all crimes. Unusually for the time, Mary had three solicitors defending her. Having any defending solicitor was unusual at the time. The prosecution case logically put forward all of the collected evidence. The evidence from the household staff, the forensic evidence and testing proving the powder was arsenic, the letters and the intensive suffering of Mr. Blandy. The defence point was to concede that Mary had indeed placed powders in her father's tea and gruel, that she had thought of the powders to be love powders that would soon soften her father towards her and would-be husband, Cranston. The judge finishing the summing up, but the jury did not move, and after a very brief consultation between themselves, the verdict was confirmed within five minutes. Mary Blandy was guilty of the murder of her father. The sentence of death was pronounced with Mary to be hung by the neck until she was dead. Possible reprieve. Mary was hopeful that she would be reprieved as she had been giving her father's forgiveness, which had been witnessed by household members. Mary was wrong. Unbeknownst to her, Members of the community petitioned against her. The crime of patricide was considered one of the very worst crimes imaginable. The townsfolk counter-petition was successful and Mary would not be reprieved. Mary's Confession In Mary's Confession to the Reverend Swinton, Mary states categorically that she was an innocent dupe to the poisoning of her father a story she stuck to until the very end. From the Caledonian Mercury, April 1752, approximately 5,000 people attended the execution. Having ascended some steps of the ladder, she said, Gentlemen, don't hang me high for the sake of decency. Being desired to go some few steps higher, she turned about and expressed her apprehensions that she would fall. The rope being put around her neck, she pulled her handkerchief over her face and was turned off on holding out a book of devotions which she had been reading. The crowd of spectators assembled on this occasion was immense, and when she had hung the usual time, she was cut down and the body being put into a hearse was conveyed to Henley-on-Thames and interred with her parents at one o'clock on the following morning. The Aftermath Cranstoon was never arrested for his part of supplying the arsenic to Mary. Having heard of Miss Blandy's commitment to Oxford jail, he concealed himself some time in Scotland and then escaped to Boulogne in France. There, some months later, Cranstoon became seriously ill and died. In his effects was a trunk with letters from Mary that would prove whether she had been a willing instrument of death or a naive dupe in the poisoning of her father. Letter 1, dated the 30th of June, 1751, states, 
the old woman that chars sometimes in the house having drank a little liquor in which I had put some is very bad, and I am conscious of the affair being discovered. When you write, let it be as mystically as you please. Mary also said she was in great distress of mind when she thinks of the affair in hand. Letter 2, dated July 16, 1751. In this letter, there is a reference to the polishing of the pebbles, which would seem to refer to the packets of powder, and that she would let Cranston know when the good effect of the scheme took place. Letter 3, dated August 1, 1751. In this letter, she states that she is going forward with all convenient speed in the business, and is sometimes in the greatest frights, there being constantly about me so many to be kept insensible of the affair. Thus ends the historical case of Mary Blandy and the poisoning of her father. Mary was never tried for the murder of her mother, which could have been raised as mere village gossip. The question remains on what a poor lovesick girl will do to obtain her love. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, the infamous Mary Blandy case. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers. And with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times and I am Robin Coles.